I've been hiking in the Appalachian Mountains for most of my life. There's something about the solitude, the way the trees whisper in the wind, and the sheer isolation that draws me in. As a park ranger, I've spent more time out here than most people ever will, and I know these woods like the back of my hand. But there's a section of the forest I never go into. Not willingly, at least. Black Hollow. The locals have stories about it, old folk tales passed down through generations. Some say the land is cursed, others claim it's haunted. And every once in a while, someone goes missing out there. Now, I don't believe in ghosts or curses. I'm a practical man, but I respect the forest. I respect the things I can't explain. It started like any other day. I was off duty, looking for a hike to clear my head. I'd had a rough week dealing with some lost tourists and wanted to be alone. I picked a trail I hadn't been on in years, one that skirted the edge of Black Hollow. I hadn't planned on going in, just close enough to feel that eerie sense of distance between me and whatever might be lurking there. The morning fog hung low as I made my way up the ridge. The air was damp, and everything felt muted, like the world was holding its breath. I was about two hours into my hike when I spotted something unusual, a trail marker. It was old, weathered, and almost completely covered in moss, but it was there. The strange thing was, I didn't remember ever seeing a trail marker in this area before. Curiosity got the better of me, and I veered off the main path to follow it. The trail was narrow, overgrown, and clearly hadn't been used in a long time. Every few minutes, I'd find another marker, guiding me deeper into the forest. Before I knew it, I was standing at the edge of Black Hollow. I should have turned back right then. The air was different here, heavier, like it was pushing down on me. The trees grew closer together, their branches gnarled and twisted in ways that seemed unnatural. But something, maybe pride, maybe stubbornness, kept me moving forward. As I walked, I noticed how quiet it had become. No birds, no insects, nothing but the sound of my boots crunching on the leaf-strewn ground. It felt like the forest was watching me, waiting for something to happen. That's when I saw it. A cabin. Old, decrepit, and half-collapsed, hidden deep in the hollow. It looked like it hadn't been touched in decades, maybe even longer. The door was hanging off its hinges, and the windows were shattered. I don't know why, but I felt compelled to go inside. The floor creaked under my weight as I stepped through the doorway. Dust filled the air, making it hard to breathe. The interior was sparse, just a broken chair, a table, and an old iron stove in the corner. But then I saw something that made my blood run cold. A map. It was pinned to the wall, yellowed with age, but the ink was still clear. It showed the surrounding area, including trails that didn't exist on any modern map. And there, in the center, was Black Hollow. I stepped closer to get a better look, but my foot hit something hard. I glanced down and saw a small, metal box. I crouched and opened it, expecting to find nothing more than rusted junk. Instead, I found photographs. Dozens of them, all black and white. Each one showed a different person, men, women, children, all standing in front of that same cabin, smiling like they didn't have a care in the world. But there was something off about their eyes. They looked, hollow, vacant. Suddenly, I heard footsteps behind me. I spun around, my heart pounding, but no one was there. The cabin was empty. I rushed outside, expecting to see someone or something, but the forest was still. Too still. That's when I realized I wasn't alone. I don't know how to explain it, but I could feel someone, or something, watching me. My instincts told me to get out, to run, but my legs wouldn't move. And then, out of the corner of my eye, I saw it, a figure, barely visible through the trees, standing perfectly still.
At first, I thought it was another hiker, but as I stared, I realized it wasn't human. It was tall, unnaturally so, with long, bony limbs that seemed to stretch too far. Its skin was pale, almost translucent, and its face, if you could call it that, was featureless, save for two sunken eyes that glowed faintly in the dim light. I blinked, and it was gone. I didn't waste any more time. I ran. I don't know how long I ran or in what direction, but I didn't stop until I was back on the main trail. My lungs burned, and my legs felt like they were about to give out, but I kept going. I didn't dare look back. When I finally reached the trailhead, I collapsed against a tree, trying to catch my breath. I looked back into the woods, half expecting to see that figure again, but the forest was quiet. Too quiet. I reported the cabin to the other rangers, but when we went back the next day, it was gone. No sign of it, no trail markers, nothing. The photos, the map, the metal box, gone, like they never existed. The others didn't believe me. They said I must have gotten turned around, imagine the whole thing. But I know what I saw. A few months later, a local woman went missing. Last seen near Black Hollow. They never found her body, just her backpack, ripped open like something had clawed it apart. I don't go near Black Hollow anymore. I tell the tourists it's dangerous, easy to get lost in, but the truth is, I'm afraid. I don't know what's out there, but I know it's watching, waiting. And it's hungry. I heard the story again from a man who'd gone out searching for his lost brother. Same cabin, same eerie photographs, and that same figure lurking just beyond the trees. His brother had vanished without a trace, leaving only a single boot behind. I always loved hiking, and back in the summer of 1986, I was on my usual solo trip in the Appalachian Mountains, following an old trail I'd heard about from a local park ranger. It wasn't marked on any official maps, just a narrow track through the undergrowth, forgotten by most people but still alive in whispers and old stories. The ranger, an older guy named Bill, had told me about it with a grin that didn't quite reach his eyes. They call it the Devil's Ridge, he said, leaning against the counter at the small ranger station. Locals avoid it. Always have. Used to be more folks around here, but people started disappearing. I laughed it off, of course. These mountains are full of folklore, and I was a seasoned hiker, not the kind to get spooked easily. I figured Bill was just messing with me, trying to see if I'd bite. Still, there was something about the way he said it, something about the way his hand tightened on the counter as he spoke, that stuck with me. But I wasn't the superstitious type. I was just looking for a challenge and maybe a bit of quiet, away from the usual trails crowded with campers and day trippers. I set off early that morning with my gear packed, the sky clear and the sun just rising over the horizon. The trail wasn't easy to find just a narrow gap between trees that I would have missed if I hadn't been looking for it. I stepped through, pushing branches out of the way, and felt the temperature drop immediately. The trees here were older, taller, their leaves thick enough to block out most of the sunlight. The air was still, almost too still, like the forest was holding its breath. As I moved deeper, the usual sounds of the woods, the chirping of birds, the rustling of leaves, began to fade. I told myself it was just the dense trees muffling the noise, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. I kept glancing over my shoulder, half expecting to see someone there, but the path behind me was always empty. After about two hours, I came across the first sign that something wasn't right. I found an old campsite, though old doesn't quite capture it. The tent was torn to shreds, the fabric flapping in the slight breeze, and the fire pit was filled with ash long since cold. A few pieces of gear lay scattered around, rusted from years of neglect. 
There were no signs of a struggle, no blood or anything like that, but the whole scene felt wrong, like whoever had been here left in a hurry and never came back. I knelt by the fire pit, poking through the ashes with a stick. That's when I noticed it, a small, carved figure, half buried in the dirt. It was crudely made, about the size of my palm, and looked like some kind of animal, but not one I recognized. Its eyes were just deep holes, and its mouth was an open maw, twisted like it was screaming. I pocketed it, thinking I'd ask Bill about it when I got back. Pushing on, the trail got steeper, winding up the side of the ridge. The higher I climbed, the worse the feeling in my gut got. It wasn't just the physical strain, I'd done tougher hikes before without feeling like this. No, this was something else, like the air itself was pressing down on me, making it hard to breathe. Then, around midday, I saw it. There was a figure ahead of me, standing at the edge of the path where it opened up into a small clearing. At first, I thought it was another hiker, someone who'd taken the same unmarked trail, but as I got closer, I realized it wasn't quite right. The figure was tall, unnaturally so, and its skin was pale, almost translucent. It stood completely still, not even breathing, just staring off into the distance. I called out, but it didn't respond. My heart was pounding in my chest, but I kept walking, though my legs felt like lead. As I approached, I noticed something else, the figure wasn't standing on the ground. It was hovering, just a few inches above the dirt, as if gravity didn't apply to it. I stopped dead in my tracks. Every instinct was screaming at me to turn around and run, but I couldn't. I was frozen, just staring at this thing. Then, without warning, it turned its head and looked directly at me. Its eyes, or what passed for eyes, were empty sockets, like the figure I'd found carved in the dirt. I couldn't move, couldn't breathe. It didn't make a sound, but somehow, I could hear it in my head, a low, droning hum that made my skull feel like it was going to split open. Then, just as quickly as it had appeared, it was gone. One second it was there, the next it wasn't. The clearing was empty, the trail ahead clear. I don't know how long I stood there, just staring at the spot where it had been. Eventually, I forced myself to move, telling myself it was just my imagination, that I was dehydrated or tired. But deep down, I knew that wasn't true. I pressed on, though my pace had slowed, and I kept glancing over my shoulder. The sun was starting to dip lower in the sky, casting long shadows across the path, and I knew I had to find a place to camp soon. I didn't want to be out here after dark. Finally, I found a flat spot near the base of a rocky outcrop, just big enough for my tent. I set up quickly, trying to ignore the feeling that I was being watched. I ate a quick meal, then crawled into my sleeping bag, but I couldn't sleep. Every rustle of leaves, every creak of a branch had me on edge, my hand gripping the hilt of my hunting knife. At some point, I must have dozed off, because the next thing I knew, I was jolted awake by a sound outside my tent. It wasn't an animal, I've spent enough time in the woods to know the difference. This was something else, a low, scraping noise, like something dragging itself across the ground. I lay there, heart pounding, listening. The noise got closer, stopping right outside my tent. I held my breath, gripping the knife so tight my knuckles ached. Then, the tent started to move. Something was pressing against the fabric, slowly circling around me. I could see its outline in the moonlight, tall and thin, with long, spindly limbs. It stopped at the entrance, and for a moment, everything went silent. Suddenly, the zipper started to open. I lunged forward, slashing at the figure with my knife, but there was nothing there. The tent was empty, the zipper half undone. I scrambled out, scanning the area, but whatever had been there was gone. I didn't stay to find out what it was.
I packed up my gear as fast as I could and started back down the trail, not caring that it was the middle of the night. I moved as fast as I could without breaking into a full sprint, the feeling of being watched never leaving me. I didn't stop until I was back at the ranger station, the sun just beginning to rise. Bill was there, sitting on the porch with a cup of coffee, and when he saw me, his face went pale. You saw it, didn't you? he asked quietly. I didn't say anything, just nodded. He sighed and took a long sip of his coffee. Should have told you to stay away. That ridge, it's not like the rest of the mountains. People go missing up there, and not just in the usual way. Some say it's a curse, others think it's something older. All I know is, you're lucky to be standing here. I never went back to that trail. In fact, I've avoided the entire area ever since. The mountains are full of strange things, but whatever's up there on Devil's Ridge? It's something else entirely. And it's still out there. Waiting. I'm not exactly sure how I ended up in that forest. It was supposed to be a quick weekend getaway, a hike, a few beers with old friends, and a chance to get away from the noise. I'd been dealing with some personal stuff, some work stress, and frankly, the idea of disconnecting sounded like heaven. I hadn't seen Dorian, Nate, and Tim in years, and we figured it was time to reconnect, do something a little wild like we used to in college. Except, back then, Wild meant beer pong and waking up hungover on someone's couch, not this. We picked some remote spot out in the Blue Ridge Mountains. Nate had been hiking out there before and claimed it was perfect for what we wanted, quiet, peaceful, and isolated. That last word, isolated, should have been the red flag. But in our heads, we were just city boys craving the fresh air, and we weren't thinking much beyond the thrill of a weekend adventure. The trailhead was already off the beaten path, about a 30-minute drive from the nearest town, which itself felt like a place frozen in the 80s. No cell service, no gas stations with Wi-Fi. We parked our SUV, grabbed our backpacks, and started the hike around noon. The air was crisp, and the thick trees that surrounded us swallowed any sound that might have come from the outside world. It was perfect. Dorian had brought a flask of whiskey, and we passed it around as we hiked, telling stupid stories and laughing at things that were only funny because we hadn't seen each other in so long. Tim was the quiet one, as usual. He'd always been like that, more of a listener than a talker. But even he seemed relaxed, smiling as he walked at the back of the group, his eyes taking in the scenery like he was cataloging every tree and rock. After about two hours of hiking, we set up camp by a small stream. Nate, always the one with the survival skills, started a fire while I set up the tents. Dorian wandered off to gather more wood, or so he said, and Tim sat by the fire, staring into the flames like he could see something the rest of us couldn't. He was like that, always a little off in his own world. We had just settled in when Dorian came back, his face pale eyes wide like he'd seen something that didn't make sense. There's a cabin, he said, pointing back the way he came. Just a little ways off the trail. A cabin? We hadn't seen a soul all day, and there were no signs of anyone else being around. But curiosity won out, and after some prodding from Nate, we all agreed to check it out. It wasn't far, maybe a five-minute walk from our campsite but as we got closer, something about it felt wrong. It wasn't just the state of the cabin itself, run down, with rotting wood and a roof that looked like it might cave in at any moment, but the air around it. You know how sometimes you walk into a place and feel like you shouldn't be there, like the space itself rejects your presence? That's what it felt like. Nate pushed the door open with the butt of his flashlight, and we stepped inside. The smell hit us first, mold, damp wood, and something else I couldn't quite place. The inside was sparse, just a couple of chairs, a table, 
and a rusted stove in the corner. Dust clung to every surface, and it was clear no one had lived there in years. Or so we thought. On the table was an old, leather-bound journal. Tim, being the only one who gave a damn about reading, picked it up and started flipping through the pages. His face went pale after a minute of silence, and he handed it to me without saying a word. The handwriting was messy, jagged, like the writer had been in a hurry or scared. It talked about someone or something living in the woods, watching from the trees. Whoever wrote it had become obsessed, convinced they were being stalked, hunted even. The last entry was only a few sentences long, can't stay here. It's close now. Too close. I can hear it in the trees. We laughed it off, of course. Some old guy probably went nuts out here on his own. We left the cabin and headed back to camp, but the vibe had shifted. The woods didn't feel so friendly anymore. The trees seemed to press in closer, and every crack of a branch made me turn my head. Back at the camp, we sat around the fire in silence for a while. Nate tried to lighten the mood by passing around the whiskey again, but it didn't work. I noticed him glancing over his shoulder every few minutes, like he expected to see something standing there in the dark. It was Dorian who first said it. We should leave tomorrow. Early. No one argued. But that night, as we tried to sleep, things got worse. I woke up to the sound of footsteps, heavy and deliberate, circling the campsite. At first, I thought it was one of the guys getting up to take a leak, but when I peeked out of my tent, I saw everyone still inside theirs, fast asleep. The footsteps continued, slow and methodical, just beyond the ring of light from our dying fire. I tried to call out, but my throat closed up, and no sound came out. I wasn't frozen in fear. It was more like my body refused to acknowledge what was happening. Then, the footsteps stopped. For a long time, there was nothing but silence. Eventually, exhaustion took over, and I fell back asleep. The next morning, I woke up to chaos. Tim was gone. His tent was still there, but he wasn't. We searched the area, called his name, but there was no sign of him. His backpack, shoes, even his jacket were still at the camp. Nate wanted to hike back to the cabin, thinking maybe Tim had gone there for some reason, but when we got to the spot, it wasn't there. I know it sounds crazy, but the cabin was just, gone. Like it had never existed. The clearing where it had been was nothing but trees and underbrush. Dorian started to lose it then, yelling that it didn't make sense that we had all seen it the day before. Nate tried to calm him down, but even he was shaking. We agreed we had to get out of there, get help, report Tim missing. That's when we found him. Or, what was left of him. Tim's body was wedged between two rocks near the stream, his face unrecognizable. Blood soaked the moss around him, and his arms were twisted at unnatural angles. It wasn't an animal attack. I don't know what did it, but it wasn't an animal. Nate threw up, and Dorian started backing away, muttering to himself, No way, no way. I tried to pull myself together, but all I could think was how quickly things had spiraled out of control. Just twenty-four hours ago, we were laughing and drinking, and now, this. We didn't talk as we packed up camp. We just moved like robots, the only goal being to get out of those woods. By the time we reached the car, the sun was already setting, and the sense of relief I expected never came. Something followed us. I don't know what it was, but I felt it. We all did. We reported Tim's death to the authorities, but they didn't find anything out of the ordinary. Just some weird, tragic accident, they said but it wasn't. Something was out there with us. Something that wanted us gone. I don't go hiking anymore. Neither does Dorian. Nate tried to talk to me about it once, tried to rationalize it, 
but we both knew better. Some places, you're just not supposed to go. My name is Tom, and I've always been an outdoorsman. Grew up in the hills of West Virginia, learning from an early age how to fish, track, and navigate the dense, misty forests. There's a kind of quiet peace out there, the kind that settles into your bones, makes you feel connected to something ancient. It was always my escape from the noise of the world. In the late summer of 1995, I found myself yearning for another solo hike. I had a spot I liked, deep in the Appalachian Mountains, a trail less traveled by tourists and more familiar to the locals. They called it the Hollow Woods, a thick stretch of forest that seemed to breathe with the land. You wouldn't find it in any guidebook. In fact, most folks would tell you to avoid it altogether. There were stories, of course, tales about strange things seen in the woods, hunters that never came back. But I always took that kind of talk with a grain of salt. I knew those mountains like the back of my hand. Or so I thought. I packed light for the weekend, a sturdy knife, some canned food, my old compass, and a map that had been passed down from my grandfather. The Hollowoods Trail wasn't marked, but the map showed old logging routes that were barely visible unless you knew what to look for. I'd been there once before with my dad, years ago when I was just a boy. He told me stories of the Appalachian folklore, how there were creatures older than man hidden deep in those woods. He believed it, but I didn't. Until this trip. It started like any other hike. The air was crisp, the scent of pine thick in my nose. Birds called out in the distance, and the occasional rustle of underbrush let me know I wasn't alone. Deer, maybe a fox, normal stuff. I followed the trail until it narrowed, the trees growing so close together that the canopy blotted out most of the sky. I could feel the temperature drop as I moved deeper into the woods. That wasn't unusual for this part of the mountains, the trees trapped the cold air and kept the sunlight from warming the ground. As I walked, I noticed something odd. The usual sounds of the forest, birds, insects, the wind through the leaves, had faded. It wasn't dead silent, but there was a strange stillness, like the woods were holding their breath. My gut told me to turn around, but I didn't listen. I pressed on, my boots crunching over the dry leaves. After a few hours, I found a good spot to set up camp. There was a clearing, surrounded by thick trees on all sides, with just enough space for my tent and a small fire. As I started unpacking, I saw something that made me pause. At the far edge of the clearing, partially hidden by ferns and moss, was an old stone foundation, what looked like the remains of a cabin. I'd never seen it marked on any map. Curiosity got the better of me. I walked over, pushing the ferns aside, and saw that the stones were blackened, like they'd been scorched. Whatever structure had been here had burned down long ago. There was a strange symbol carved into one of the stones, something like a spiral, but it didn't look like any kind of marking I'd ever seen before. I felt uneasy, like I was intruding on something that wasn't meant to be found. But again, I brushed it off. The rest of the evening passed uneventfully. I got a fire going, cooked up some beans, and settled in for the night. The forest had remained quiet, the only sounds being the crackling of the fire and the occasional snap of a twig somewhere out in the darkness. I convinced myself it was just a raccoon or a deer, though I never saw anything. Sometime in the middle of the night, I woke up. The fire had died down to embers, and the air was frigid. But it wasn't the cold that had stirred me. It was the feeling that I wasn't alone. I lay still, listening, and that's when I heard it, soft, almost imperceptible, but there, breathing. Not my own, not an animal's. Something heavy and deliberate, just outside the tent. My heart pounded in my chest as I reached for my knife. I strained to listen, and the breathing grew louder, closer. 
It circled the tent, slow and methodical, as if it was studying me. I could hear the crunch of leaves underfoot, the occasional snap of a twig. Whatever it was, it was big. I thought about bolting out of the tent and running, but I knew better. Running would only trigger the predator instinct, whatever this thing was. So, I lay there, clutching my knife, trying to control my breathing. After what felt like hours, the sound stopped. The breathing, the footsteps, gone. But the silence that followed was worse. It was so oppressive, so unnatural. Morning came, and with it, a thick fog that blanketed the clearing. I packed up camp as fast as I could, my nerves on edge. The strange foundation, the breathing, none of it felt right. I needed to get out of those woods. As I made my way back down the trail, I noticed something that stopped me in my tracks. On the trees around me, about ten feet up, were claw marks. Not bear marks, these were deep, gouged into the bark, and too wide to be any animal I knew of. My pulse quickened. I wasn't imagining things. Something was out there, and it had been close. Real close. I hurried my pace, not wanting to linger any longer than I had to. But the deeper I got into the woods, the more disoriented I became. The trail that I had known since childhood seemed different, twisted. Landmarks that should have been there, an old rock formation, a fallen tree, were missing. It was like the woods had changed overnight, shifting around me. Panic started to creep in. I wasn't lost, was I? That's when I saw it. Up ahead, in the fog, stood a figure. At first, I thought it was another hiker, but as I moved closer, I realized how wrong I was. The figure was tall, impossibly tall, and hunched over. Its limbs were too long, its skin pale and stretched tight over its bones. It didn't move, just stood there, watching me. And then it smiled. Or at least, that's what I think it was. Its mouth stretched too wide, revealing rows of jagged teeth. I froze. My mind raced, trying to rationalize what I was seeing. Maybe it was a trick of the light, maybe it was. No, there was no explaining this. I slowly reached for my knife, but before I could even think about defending myself, the figure vanished into the fog. One second it was there, the next it was gone. I didn't wait around. I ran, ignoring the twisting paths and the aching in my legs. I ran until the trees thinned, and I stumbled onto the old logging road. My lungs burned, but I didn't stop until I reached my car. I've never looked back. Later, I learned that several hikers had gone missing in the hollow woods over the years, their bodies never found. Some locals blamed it on wild animals, others on the rugged terrain. But after what I saw, I wasn't so sure. To this day, I can still hear that breathing in the dark, and I know, whatever was out there in the hollow woods, it's still waiting. They say the Appalachian Trail is long and winding, stretching over 2,000 miles from Georgia to Maine, but no one really tells you about the parts that stretch into the unknown. My name's Doug Carver, and I've spent most of my life hiking, camping, and eventually working as a guide. It was the 1990s, and I had just started doing more solo hikes. I wasn't afraid of much. Bears, snakes, they were part of the job. I'd encountered them enough to know what to do. But this, this was different. This was something I can barely put into words, yet it's seared into my mind. I'm only alive because I turned back. Not everyone was that lucky. It was late September. Fall was creeping in, and the leaves were just starting to turn. I had planned a hike through a lesser-known part of the trail, in a section near the Smoky Mountains that wasn't officially maintained. The locals called it the Old Trail because the Park Service had long since stopped marking it. Overgrown, forgotten, but still walkable if you knew what you were doing. A group of us had been up there a week earlier, leading a group of weekend hikers, and we had found something, something strange. A makeshift shelter, old as dirt, 
made of animal bones and sticks, tucked away in a hollow. It wasn't one of those harmless, backwood shacks built by drifters or hermits. It felt wrong. The air was different there, thick and heavy. We reported it, of course, but no one seemed to care. A ranger told me it was probably just an old hunting blind. But I had never seen a blind made of bones. I should have listened to my gut then. But I didn't. A week later, I decided to go back, alone this time, to figure out what it was. I had this ridiculous notion that I could solve a mystery or stumble on something significant. What I found instead was more than I could handle. The morning I set out, the air was crisp, and the sky was overcast, the way it usually gets when a cold front's about to move in. I packed light, a sleeping bag, some freeze-dried meals, a small knife, and my canteen. I was planning to be out there for two nights, tops. My boots were well broken in, and I had enough experience to know the land better than most folks. By noon, I had already left the main trail behind, pushing through underbrush and thorny vines. The map I had was more of a sketch, with barely legible markings from someone who'd hiked the area decades before. It didn't take long to feel the isolation. No hikers, no distant chatter just the soft rustling of the wind and the occasional chirp of birds. Even the animal tracks started to disappear. It was like the forest itself was holding its breath, waiting for something. That evening, I set up camp in a small clearing near a stream. I had found the old trail, all right, little more than a faint indentation between the trees. My fire crackled weakly, barely keeping out the cold, and as I sat there, Cooking a small pot of instant noodles, I realized something. The forest was quiet. Not the usual nighttime quiet, where crickets sing and branches snap in the distance. This was absolute silence. My skin crawled. Suddenly, I heard it, at first, just the faintest of sounds, like a low hum or buzz. It wasn't mechanical, though more like a deep vibration in the earth. I stood up, listening hard, trying to pinpoint it. And then it stopped, just as quickly as it had started. The silence returned, more suffocating than before. I told myself it was nothing. Maybe a distant plane or a tremor. I lay down in my tent and tried to sleep, but my mind kept drifting back to that shelter we found. Bones. There had been bones. Around midnight, I woke up to the sound of something outside. Not far from my tent, maybe ten feet away, a stick cracked. I sat up, heart pounding in my chest. Bears? I grabbed my knife and slowly unzipped the tent, just enough to peek out. The fire was nothing more than embers, casting faint red shadows, but in that dim light, I saw a figure. Someone, or something, was standing at the edge of the clearing. It wasn't moving, just standing there. My breath caught in my throat. At first, I thought it was a man, but the way it was hunched, too tall, too thin. It didn't feel human. I couldn't make out its face, but it was staring right at me. I froze, gripping the knife, every muscle tense. The figure didn't move. Minutes passed, or maybe it was seconds, I couldn't tell. But then, as if a switch had been flipped, it turned and walked back into the woods. No sound. No rustling of leaves. Just gone. I didn't sleep that night. The fire stayed lit, and I sat by it, knife in hand, listening for anything that might come back. Nothing did. By morning, I was ready to pack up and head back, but something nagged at me. Maybe it was pride, or maybe I didn't want to leave with more questions than I came with. Either way, I convinced myself to stay just a little longer. I'd follow the trail for a few more hours, see what I could find, and then head back before dark. As I pushed deeper into the woods, the landscape started to change.
the trees became thicker, the underbrush more tangled, like the forest was trying to swallow the trail whole. I noticed something strange too, no birds, no signs of animals. Even the air smelled different, damp and earthy, like the ground had been undisturbed for centuries. And then I found it, the shelter. Except this time, it wasn't empty. There, crouched inside the bone structure, was a woman. Her back was to me, and she was covered in dirt and matted hair, wearing ragged clothing. She didn't hear me approach, and for a moment, I just stood there, frozen. My mind raced. She couldn't have been there long, could she? No one had mentioned a missing hiker. Hey! I called out, voice shaking a bit. Are you alright? She didn't move. I stepped closer, knife still in hand. Ma'am? And then she turned. Her face, it wasn't right. Her eyes were too big, too wide, and her mouth hung open in a way that made my stomach churn. But it wasn't the look of her that terrified me. It was the sheer emptiness behind those eyes, like I was staring into something far older and more dangerous than I could comprehend. Without a word, she lunged at me. I barely had time to react. I swung the knife wildly, more out of instinct than skill. She was fast, faster than any human should be, but as she closed in, I saw it. A necklace, hanging from her neck, made of bones, small, delicate bones, like they had been carved from something not much bigger than a child. I stumbled back, barely keeping my footing as I slashed at her. I didn't want to hurt her, she didn't even look like she could feel pain. But I knew I had to get out of there. The edge of my knife caught her arm, and she recoiled, hissing like an animal. That was my chance. I ran. I didn't stop running until I reached the main trail, hours later, breath ragged and heart pounding in my chest. I never looked back. By the time I made it to the nearest ranger station, I could barely speak. I told them everything, about the woman, the shelter, the figure in the woods, but they didn't believe me. Said it was probably just the stress of being out there alone. But I know what I saw. And I'm not the only one. I never thought much about the tales locals used to tell in small towns. As a park ranger stationed in the Appalachian Mountains, I've heard my fair share of ghost stories and folklore. Most of them seemed harmless, tales spun to keep kids from wandering off into the deep woods or to pass the time around a campfire. But, there was one particular legend that stuck out, the story of the whaler. According to the locals, it was an ancient creature, born from the grief of lost settlers, whose cries could lure the unwary into the wilderness, never to return. Of course, I never gave much credence to the stories. I was a man of reason, of the outdoors, someone who dealt in real dangers, mountain lions, bears, and the occasional foolish hiker getting themselves lost. But that all changed in the fall of 1997. It was mid-October, and the first touches of winter were already creeping in. The air was crisp, and the trees had shed most of their leaves, leaving the forest floor carpeted in shades of red and brown. My shift that day was supposed to be routine. A few hikers had come through the area earlier in the week, but nothing out of the ordinary. The trail I was patrolling, the Swamp Run Trail, was remote and seldom used, even by locals. That day, I was making my final rounds, walking the trail, checking for any signs of distress. I had about another hour to go before I could head back to the station and grab a warm cup of coffee. That's when I heard it. At first, it was just a faint cry, almost like a coyote in the distance. But there was something off about it, something human. I stopped in my tracks, listening carefully. The sound came again, louder this time, and unmistakably human. It was a wail, long and mournful. Help, a voice called out, strained and panicked. 
my training kicked in. It wasn't unusual for hikers to get injured or lost, especially this deep in the woods. I quickly adjusted my radio and called into the station, informing them that I was going to check out a possible distress call. I began moving toward the sound, the cries growing more desperate with each step. My instincts told me something was wrong, but I pressed on, following the voice. It was odd, though. No one should have been this far off the marked trail, especially with how treacherous the terrain could be. I kept my flashlight train ahead, scanning for any signs of movement. The forest was eerily silent except for the occasional gust of wind. As I ventured deeper, the cries grew louder and more anguished. Please, the voice echoed again, sending a chill down my spine. After what felt like an eternity, I stumbled upon a clearing. There, huddled against the base of a large oak tree, was a man. He looked like he'd been through hell, his clothes were torn, his face covered in dirt and scratches. He was shaking, his eyes wide with fear. I approached cautiously, not wanting to startle him. Hey, are you okay? I asked, shining my flashlight toward him. He didn't answer at first. His breathing was ragged, his hands clutched tightly around his knees. Finally, he looked up at me, his eyes wild and full of terror. It's coming, he whispered, barely audible. What's coming? I asked, kneeling beside him. The wailer, he muttered, his voice trembling. My stomach tightened at the mention of the old folklore. I had never heard anyone speak of the whaler seriously. Let's get you back to the station, I said, trying to keep my voice calm. But he didn't move. His eyes were fixed on the tree line, unblinking. You can't stop it. It's already here, he said in a flat, hollow voice. I was about to press him further when I heard something, a faint cry like the one that had led me here. But this time, it was much closer. It sounded, wrong. Like a woman wailing, but distorted, twisted in a way that made the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end. I stood up quickly, my flashlight swinging toward the sound. The forest around us was bathed in darkness, the faint glow of my light doing little to penetrate the thick shadows. For a moment, everything was still. Then, the wail came again, closer now, and followed by something else, footsteps, soft but deliberate, moving through the underbrush. I gripped the handle of my flashlight tighter, scanning the area. Come on, we need to move, I said, pulling the man to his feet. He resisted at first, but I wasn't about to let him sit there and wait for whatever was out there. We began to make our way back through the woods my flashlight flickering slightly as we moved. The man's breathing was heavy, his eyes darting around wildly. Every few steps, he would glance behind us, muttering under his breath. The wailing sound followed us, echoing through the trees. Each time it came, it was closer, more insistent, almost, hungry. I tried to ignore it, focusing on getting us back to the main trail but the sense of dread was overwhelming. It felt like the very forest was closing in around us. Suddenly, the man stopped dead in his tracks. No, he whispered, staring ahead. I followed his gaze and froze. In the distance, barely visible through the trees, was a figure, a woman, pale and gaunt, standing perfectly still. Her long dark hair hung in front of her face, her clothes tattered and torn. She wasn't moving, but I could feel her eyes on us, even though I couldn't see them. Keep walking, I said firmly, pushing the man forward. My heart was pounding in my chest, but I couldn't let him see my fear. We moved faster now, my flashlight sweeping the path ahead. The woman didn't follow, but the wailing continued, louder and more frantic. It was all around us, as if the very forest had come alive with the sound. The man beside me was muttering incoherently, his words a jumbled mess of fear and desperation.
Then, without warning, he bolted. Hey! I shouted, running after him. But he was fast, faster than I expected, darting through the trees like a man possessed. I struggled to keep up, my breath coming in ragged gasps. I lost sight of him for a moment, and then I heard it, a scream, sharp and piercing, cutting through the night air. I raced toward the sound, my flashlight bouncing wildly in my hand. When I reached him, he was lying on the ground, his body twisted unnaturally. His eyes were wide open, but there was no life in them. He was dead. There was no sign of injury, no blood, nothing to indicate what had happened. But I knew, deep down, that something had taken him. Something that wasn't human. I stood there for a long time, staring down at his lifeless body, my mind racing. The wailing had stopped, and the forest was deathly silent. I knew I needed to get out of there, but my legs felt like lead, frozen in place by a terror I couldn't explain. Finally, I forced myself to move. I turned and began walking back toward the trail, my flashlight flickering again as I moved through the trees. The air was thick with the weight of something unseen, something watching. I never reported the man's death. I knew no one would believe me. Instead, I buried him there in the forest, marking the spot with a simple pile of stones. I told the station he had run off, and I couldn't find him. They wrote it off as another lost hiker, one of many who disappeared in those woods over the years. But I know the truth. Something is out there, something that can't be explained. And every now and then, late at night, I hear it, the wailing, faint but unmistakable, calling out through the trees. We didn't even know where we were going at first, just that we had to get out. Aiden's family cabin was up in the Adirondacks, and the plan had been to head there for a weekend, disconnect from everything and maybe drink more beer than we should. But as soon as we pulled into the driveway, an argument broke out. Aiden had forgotten to tell his older brother about the trip, and they hadn't been on good terms for months. It was a shouting match that ended with Aiden storming back to the truck, swearing he'd never speak to his brother again. The rest of us, well, we just grabbed our bags and waited for him to calm down. Aiden wasn't the kind of guy to back down, and by the time we were halfway down the road, he had already changed plans. Instead of the cabin, he wanted to camp. Real camping, he said. He knew of a place deep in the forest, far from any tourist trail. He swore it would be a better time, with no one else around but us. It sounded like a bad idea, but nobody wanted to argue with Aiden when he was mad. So. We nodded along like idiots, figuring it would be just another story to tell later. We grabbed some extra supplies from a store in a nearby town and followed Aiden's directions to this hidden spot. As we drove deeper into the forest, the road got rougher. Eventually, the trail became too narrow for the truck, so we parked it and started walking. None of us had ever been here before, not even Aiden. We thought he was just showing off pretending to know his way around. Still, there was something peaceful about being out there. No sounds except for the wind through the trees and the occasional crunch of leaves underfoot. The whole place was drenched in that thick, late summer air that clings to your skin. The further we walked, though, the less peaceful it felt. It wasn't that anything was out of the ordinary, it was more like we were out of place. The kind of unease that creeps in when you realize you might have bitten off more than you can chew. Aiden didn't seem to notice, though. He was determined to get us somewhere cool, as he kept putting it, even if it meant trekking into the woods with nothing but a vague memory of where the spot was supposed to be. We set up camp around dusk, right next to a creek that Aiden claimed led to some waterfall. It was a decent enough spot, flat and shaded by a thick canopy of trees. The night was clear, and as the stars started to come out, the tension from earlier seemed to fade. We made a fire, cracked open the beers, 
and spent the next few hours bullshitting and laughing like everything was fine. But things were never fine with Aiden. He always had to push things too far. Around midnight, when the fire was dying down, Aiden got this look in his eye. He grabbed a flashlight and said he was going to check out the waterfall. He tried to drag us with him, but none of us were interested in wandering around in the dark. Aiden didn't care. He grinned, called us a bunch of cowards, and then disappeared into the trees. That was the last time any of us saw Aiden alive. He was gone for maybe an hour before we started to get worried. He hadn't come back, and we couldn't hear him. No rustling, no voice calling out, just silence. Greg was the first to suggest going after him, but nobody moved. We were all thinking the same thing, if Aiden was screwing with us, we didn't want to give him the satisfaction of knowing he had us scared. But when another thirty minutes passed, Greg stood up, grabbed a flashlight, and said he was going after him. I wish we hadn't let him go alone. Greg came back, eventually, but he wasn't the same. He stumbled into camp like he didn't know where he was, his face pale and his eyes wide. He was shaking, barely able to get the words out, but when he did, they hit like a gut punch. I found him, Greg said. He's, he's dead. We didn't believe him at first. It didn't make sense. Aiden was tough, invincible in our eyes. But Greg's face was white as a sheet, and when he told us again, this time with more details, the reality set in. Aiden had fallen, or maybe he had been pushed, down a ravine near the creek. His body was twisted, one leg bent at a horrible angle. In his head, Greg couldn't even finish the description. We scrambled to follow Greg back to where he'd found Aiden. The flashlight beam cut through the trees, but it only made things worse. Everything looked wrong in that cold, artificial light. When we finally reached the ravine, the smell hit us first. Then the silence. No sounds of wildlife, no wind. Just us, staring down at what used to be our friend. We were out in the middle of nowhere with no cell service, no map, and no real idea how to get help. Even if we could have called someone, it would have taken hours for anyone to reach us. For a moment, we just stood there, paralyzed. Then, one of us, I don't remember who, suggested we. Go back to camp, regroup, and figure out what to do next. We agreed, but we couldn't leave Aiden like that. So we wrapped his body in the tarp we'd used to cover the firewood and dragged him back to camp. That's when things went from bad to worse. We were all on edge, nobody talking much. Greg was a mess, pacing around the camp and muttering under his breath. He kept saying something wasn't right about the fall. He'd been the one to find Aiden and he swore there were footprints, fresh ones, near the edge of the ravine. Footprints that didn't belong to any of us. It didn't make sense. We were miles from any trail. No one knew we were here, except for Aiden's brother, and there was no way he could have followed us. But Greg wouldn't let it go. He kept insisting someone else was out there, watching us. We didn't believe him. We couldn't. But then, the next morning, we found out Greg was right. When we woke up, the tarp was empty. Aiden's body was gone. Just like that, no blood trail, no sign of a struggle. Just an empty tarp where his body had been. We tore through the camp, shouting his name, as if he was still alive, as if he could somehow hear us. But deep down, we knew something far worse had happened. We had to get out of there. We packed up what we could carry and started hiking back to the truck. But as we walked, we felt it. Eyes on us. Every snap of a twig, every rustle in the leaves, made us jump. Greg kept looking over his shoulder, swearing he could hear footsteps that weren't ours. By the time we reached the truck, Greg was losing it.
he refused to get in, saying whoever took Aiden would follow us back. He was paranoid, convinced that someone was stalking us, waiting for the right moment to strike. We argued, trying to calm him down, but nothing worked. In the end, Greg ran back into the forest, screaming Aiden's name. We didn't go after him. We drove straight to the nearest town, not stopping until we reached a payphone to call the police. They sent out a search party the next day. They found Greg's body at the bottom of the same ravine where Aiden had fallen. But they never found Aiden. We didn't go back to the forest. None of us ever will. It was the summer of 1998 when we decided to take a trip into the Appalachian Mountains. I was living in North Carolina at the time, working odd jobs just to make rent. My friends, Kurt, Layla, and Ben, had been talking about getting out of the city for a while, and I didn't need much convincing to join them. I'd been working nonstop for months, and I was starting to feel trapped. Kurt had some family property deep in the woods, miles away from any main road. He promised us it would be the perfect spot to clear our heads and forget about our everyday problems. The day we left, the air was sticky, the kind of southern heat that makes the back of your neck damp before you even get out the door. I packed light, just some camping gear, a couple of sandwiches, and a flask. We loaded everything into Kurt's old Bronco and headed west, away from the bustle of the small towns and into the dense forest. Kurt drove with the windows down, country music blaring over the wind rushing through the car. The deeper we went, the quieter it got. The thick canopy of trees swallowed all the sounds of civilization. Eventually, we hit a dirt road that was barely wide enough for Kurt's truck. After an hour of bumping along through the woods, we arrived at an old cabin. It was small, only one floor, with a rusted metal roof that had definitely seen better days. Still, it had charm, like something out of an old postcard. Kurt's granddad built it back in the fifties, and it hadn't changed much since then. We unpacked quickly and settled into the cabin, tossing our sleeping bags onto the creaky wooden floor. The cabin didn't have much, just a couple of rooms, an old wood stove, and a shed out back. No electricity. No running water. It was rustic, but that was the point. That first day, we hiked the trails nearby, cracking jokes and drinking cheap beer we'd packed into our bags. Ben, always the prankster, kept trying to scare Layla by jumping out from behind trees. She'd shriek, and then smack him on the arm, laughing it off. The vibe was easy, familiar, like we were all kids again and not a group of adults slowly drowning in responsibilities. As the sun began to set, we headed back to the cabin to start a fire and make dinner. We were halfway through roasting some hot dogs when Kurt mentioned something strange. You know, my granddad used to tell me stories about this place, he said his face flickering in the firelight. About people going missing out here. Layla scoffed. Yeah, right. People always say stuff like that to scare you. No, seriously, Kurt said, leaning in a little closer. He told me that a couple of hunters disappeared not too far from here back in the sixties. They found their gear, but never their bodies. Ben smirked classic ghost story, man. You really believe that? Kurt shrugged. I don't know. I just thought it was weird. Grandad said some of the old-timers thought it wasn't an animal that got them, but a person. That got my attention. I wasn't superstitious, but I had a healthy respect for the wilderness. People could do some messed up things when they thought they were far enough away from the law. We let it drop after that, and the rest of the evening passed without incident. By the time we crawled into our sleeping bags, the fire had burned down to embers, and the forest was dead silent. I woke up sometime in the middle of the night. At first, I didn't know what had pulled me out of sleep, 
but then I heard it, a faint rustling sound outside, like someone walking through the underbrush. I sat up, straining to hear over the sound of my own breathing. The others were still asleep, their snores low and rhythmic. I waited, hoping it was just an animal passing by. But then the sound came again, closer this time. My heart started pounding, and I quietly grabbed the flashlight from my pack. I didn't want to wake anyone, but I also didn't want to step outside and find something, or someone, I wasn't prepared for. After what felt like forever, the noise stopped. I must have sat there for at least another hour, gripping that flashlight, my eyes glued to the door. Eventually, exhaustion won out, and I lay back down, though I barely slept. The next morning, I told the others what I'd heard. Layla dismissed it as a deer or a raccoon, but Kurt's face was serious. I'll check the perimeter, just in case, he said, grabbing his rifle. We spent most of the day hanging around the cabin, feeling the tension that hadn't been there before. Kurt came back from his patrol and said he hadn't seen anything, but the look on his face told me he wasn't entirely convinced. That evening, after another quiet day, we decided to turn in early. I couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't right. It wasn't long after we fell asleep that the banging started. Loud, sharp knocks against the cabin door. We all shot up at once, the adrenaline hitting like a freight train. Kurt grabbed his rifle, and Ben scrambled to find his pocket knife. Who the hell is that? Layla whispered, her eyes wide with fear. I don't know, Kurt said, his voice low. But they're not getting inside. The banging continued, harder this time, like whoever, or whatever, was out there was trying to break the door down. My hands were shaking as I clicked on the flashlight and aimed it at the window, hoping to catch a glimpse of something, anything, outside. But all I saw was darkness. Open the door, a voice called out from the other side, rough and gravelly. I just want to talk. Kurt shook his head, backing up toward the door. Who the hell are you? Silence followed, then the voice again. Open the door, Kurt. We froze. Whoever it was, they knew his name. I looked at Kurt, but he was pale, gripping the rifle so tight his knuckles were white. He didn't know who it was. Just go away, man. Ben yelled, but the voice didn't respond. The banging stopped, and everything went quiet. Too quiet. We waited for what felt like hours, but there was nothing. Just the sound of the wind through the trees. Finally, Kurt moved to the window, peeking outside cautiously. Nobody's out there, he whispered. I was about to say we should just stay put until morning when the sound of breaking glass erupted from the other side of the cabin. Layla screamed as a figure dressed in black climbed through the shattered window, a long knife gleaming in their hand. Kurt raised the rifle, but before he could fire, the figure lunged at him. The two of them hit the ground hard, the knife flashing in the dim light. Ben rushed forward, tackling the intruder but they were fast, slipping out of his grip like water. I grabbed the first thing I could find, a log from the firewood pile, and swung it at the attacker. It connected with a sickening crack, and the figure staggered back, blood pouring from their nose. Get out! I shouted, swinging the log again, forcing the intruder back toward the window. Without another word, the figure scrambled out the window and disappeared into the night. I stood there, breathing hard, my hands shaking uncontrollably. Kurt sat up slowly, blood dripping from a gash on his arm. We need to go, he said, his voice barely above a whisper. We didn't argue. We packed up what we could and left the cabin, moving quickly and quietly through the woods. None of us spoke as we made our way back to the Bronco, the sound of our footsteps the only thing cutting through the silence. It was only when we were back on the road, miles away from that cursed place, that anyone said anything. What the hell was that?
Layla asked, her voice trembling. Kurt shook his head. I don't know. But we're never going back. And that was it. It was supposed to be just another weekend hiking trip. Nothing too intense, just a few days in the mountains, away from the hum of the city. I had packed light, some food, my tent, the usual gear. It wasn't my first solo hike, and I'd always found peace in the isolation. The Appalachian Mountains were my go-to spot, vast and beautiful, offering miles of quiet trails and breathtaking views. But even in their beauty, there was something about the deep woods that always felt just a bit too still. I'd set out early on a Friday morning, following a lesser-known trail I'd heard about from a friend who was into off-the-beaten-path hikes. It wasn't on any of the usual maps, but I'd scribbled down some directions and figured it would be fine. After all, I had my GPS and a decent sense of direction. The first day was uneventful, exactly as I'd hoped. I made good time, climbing steadily through thick forests and past rushing streams. I even caught sight of some deer grazing not too far from the trail. By the time I made camp that evening, I was miles away from the nearest town. I hadn't seen another hiker all day, and that suited me just fine. It was later that night, around 10 p.m., when I first heard something strange. I was lying in my tent, the fire outside slowly dying, when I noticed it, a low, distant sound, almost like a moan carried on the wind. I sat up, straining to hear more clearly. At first, I chalked it up to the wind whistling through the trees, but the sound grew louder, more distinct. It wasn't the wind. I unzipped the tent, poked my head out, and listened. Silence. The fire crackled softly, casting flickering shadows on the trees surrounding my campsite. I scanned the area with my flashlight, half expecting to see a bear or some other wildlife moving through the brush. But nothing. The woods were as still as ever. I shook off the uneasy feeling and zipped the tent back up, figuring it was just the natural sounds of the forest playing tricks on me. The next morning, I packed up camp and set off again. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off, though. The trail felt different, somehow more oppressive. The trees seemed denser, the underbrush thicker. Every few hours, I'd hear that same moaning sound, always distant, always faint, but undeniably there. It followed me as I hiked deeper into the mountains, almost like it was circling me, waiting for the right moment. By late afternoon, I was feeling unsettled. The trail was getting harder to follow, less defined. I'd lost sight of the markers hours ago, but I figured if I just kept heading west, I'd eventually intersect with a known path. That was when I stumbled upon the cabin. It was old, clearly abandoned, its wooden boards weathered and covered in moss. The windows were shattered, and the door hung crooked on its hinges. It wasn't on any map, and judging by its condition, it hadn't been used in decades. I don't know why I felt compelled to approach it, but I did. Maybe I was curious, maybe I just wanted to rest for a while. Either way, I found myself standing at the door, peering inside. The interior was bare, save for a few broken pieces of furniture and some old, faded newspapers scattered across the floor. I stepped inside, my boots crunching on the debris. The air was musty, thick with the smell of damp wood. I glanced around, and that's when I saw it, something carved into the far wall. It was crude, almost childlike, but unmistakable. A symbol, a strange spiral, repeated over and over again. It covered nearly the entire wall. A chill ran down my spine as I stepped closer. The spiral seemed to twist and writhe as I stared at it, as though it were alive, pulsing with some hidden energy. I reached out to touch it, but stopped myself. I didn't know why, but something told me not to. I backed away from the wall, suddenly feeling very, very wrong about being in that cabin.
As I turned to leave, I heard it again, the moaning. But this time, it was close. Too close. It wasn't outside, carried on the wind. It was inside the cabin, behind me. I spun around, heart pounding in my chest, but there was nothing. Just the empty room and that damned spiral. I bolted from the cabin, my pulse racing, and didn't stop until I was well down the trail. By the time I paused to catch my breath, the sun was starting to set, casting long shadows through the trees. I needed to make camp soon, but I didn't want to stop. Something about that place, about the moaning, it wasn't natural. It wasn't right. I set up camp hastily, not bothering with a fire. I didn't want to draw any attention, not after what I'd seen. As I lay in my tent, every sound seemed amplified, the rustling of leaves, the cracking of branches, the distant call of an owl. And then, just as I was starting to drift off, I heard it again. The moaning. This time, it was right outside my tent. My blood turned to ice as I lay there, frozen, listening. It was louder now, more insistent, almost like a chant. I grabbed my flashlight and unzipped the tent, stepping outside into the cold night air. The forest was bathed in moonlight, casting everything in an eerie glow. I scanned the tree line with my light, my heart pounding in my ears. And then I saw it. At first, I thought it was a deer, standing just at the edge of the trees. But as I focused the beam of light on it, I realized it wasn't. Its body was thin, too thin, with long, spindly limbs and a head that seemed misshapen, almost too large for its body. Its eyes glowed, reflecting the light from my flashlight, but they were wrong, empty, hollow, like two pits of darkness. The thing stood there, unmoving, watching me. I couldn't tell if it was alive or dead, real or a figment of my imagination. But then it moved, slowly, deliberately, stepping toward me. The moaning grew louder, and I realized with a sickening jolt that it was coming from the creature. I stumbled back, tripping over my tent, barely able to keep my flashlight trained on it. The thing kept moving, its movements jerky and unnatural like it didn't quite know how to control its own limbs. I scrambled to my feet and ran. I didn't care where I was going, I just knew I had to get away. I don't know how long I ran, but when I finally stopped, my lungs burning and my legs shaking, I was completely lost. The trail was gone, swallowed by the dense forest. The only sounds were my ragged breaths and the pounding of my heart. I stayed there crouched in the underbrush, flashlight off, trying to stay as quiet as possible. Minutes passed, maybe hours, I don't know. But eventually, the moaning faded, and the forest was silent again. I didn't sleep that night. I didn't dare move until the first light of dawn broke through the trees. When it did, I gathered my things and started walking, praying I'd find my way back to civilization. I never saw the creature again, but I could feel it, always just out of sight, watching, waiting. It took me two days to find my way back to a known trail. When I finally stumbled out of the woods, dirty, exhausted, and half-starved, I told the rangers what had happened. They listened, but I could see the disbelief in their eyes. A search team went out to look for the cabin, but they never found it. No one else heard the moaning and no one saw the creature. I stopped hiking after that. I still love the mountains, but I can't bring myself to go back. Because I know, somewhere out there, in the deep woods, that thing is still waiting. I was sitting on my porch that evening, looking over the dog-eared map that crisscrossed with hiking trails I hadn't touched in years. The phone rang. It was Garrett, my old buddy from college. He was back in town, and he wanted to hike one of those old trails, get back to nature for a weekend. Said he missed it, missed the air out here. I didn't need much convincing.
Garrett and I used to do these hikes all the time, but life got in the way, as it does. I'm not married, no kids, but I've got responsibilities, you know? The kind that keep you tethered to your routines. But Garrett's call? It felt like a breath of fresh air in a life that was starting to feel a little stale. He suggested we take up an old trail, one we hadn't done since the summer of 94, before I moved out of state. It was deep in the Appalachian backwoods, isolated, and perfect for a weekend of camping and catching up. We were both in decent shape, and neither of us had an aversion to roughing it a bit, so it was an easy sell. Two days later, we were packed and ready, joined by Garrett's cousin Ethan and his girlfriend, Haley. I hadn't seen Ethan in years. He was a quiet, wiry guy, all limbs and serious eyes. Haley seemed cool enough, chatty but down-to-earth. We all piled into Garrett's truck, throwing our gear in the back, laughing like we were kids again. The trail started out just how I remembered it, wide, packed dirt, shaded by towering pines. But as the miles ticked by, it narrowed, turned rockier, less welcoming. Still, the air was crisp, and the sun filtered through the trees in soft, golden streams. We'd hit the campsite by early evening. That was the plan. The deeper we went, the quieter it got. You know that feeling? When the birds stop chirping, the wind seems to die down, and all you hear is your own breath? It creeps up on you in those woods. Before long, we weren't talking much. Just the crunch of boots on fallen leaves, the occasional grunt when someone tripped on a root. Hey, anyone else feel like we're being watched? Haley said, breaking the silence. She laughed, but it was a nervous sound. Ethan rolled his eyes. You've been watching too many horror movies. Garrett chimed in, nah, it's just the quiet. Messes with your head. We'll be at the campsite soon. But her words stuck with me. The back of my neck felt hot, like when someone's standing too close. I kept glancing over my shoulder, half expecting to see something, or someone, there. But it was just woods. Thick, endless woods. By the time we made camp, it was almost dark. We set up our tents in a small clearing surrounded by pines, the kind of spot you'd think was picturesque during the day, but turned into a shadowy mess as the sun dipped lower. Garrett got the fire going, and we sat around it cooking up the instant meals we'd packed. Haley was still uneasy. She kept glancing around, her hands fidgeting with the straps of her jacket. I tried to lighten the mood by making some joke about bears, but it fell flat. Everyone was tired, the kind of tired that sinks into your bones after a long day. The fire crackled, and conversation dwindled. That's when we heard it. A branch snapped in the distance. Not the harmless kind of snap that you hear all the time in the woods. This was deliberate. Heavy. Ethan froze, his fork halfway to his mouth. What was that? Garrett waved it off. Probably just a deer. But Haley's eyes were wide. That wasn't a deer. Another snap. Closer this time. I stood up, my stomach tight. Okay, I'll check it out. Garrett grabbed his flashlight. I'll go with you. We stepped away from the fire, into the shadows just beyond its glow. The beam of the flashlight cut through the trees, but all I saw was blackness and underbrush. My heart was pounding in my chest, and I wasn't sure if it was from exertion or something else. Something felt wrong. Garrett and I made it about fifty yards from the camp when we saw it, an old, dilapidated shack, hidden by overgrown foliage. It was rotting, barely standing, like something out of a bad dream. Who the hell built this out here? Garrett muttered, shining the light over the structure. I didn't answer. My throat had gone dry. I felt that same heat on the back of my neck again, 
only now it was stronger, more oppressive. Like something was close. Watching. Waiting. A sound. Now to snap this time. More like a low whistle, cutting through the trees. Garrett swung the flashlight in the direction of the noise, but there was nothing. Just more woods. We should head back, I said, my voice low. Garrett nodded, and we turned, moving quickly back to camp. The moment we broke into the clearing, I saw Haley and Ethan standing by the fire, their faces pale. Haley rushed up to us, panic in her eyes. Where the hell were you guys? She snapped. We heard something, someone, out there. Calm down, Garrett said, though his voice was tense. It's... probably just animals. Ethan shook his head. That wasn't an animal, man. I saw someone. In the trees. Watching us. I felt my stomach twist. Did you actually see them? Ethan swallowed, nodding. I saw movement. Just for a second. But there was someone there. No one said anything for a while after that. The fire crackled, casting flickering shadows on the trees around us, but none of us moved away from its light. We huddled closer to the warmth, keeping our eyes on the dark woods beyond. Hours passed. We took turns keeping watch, but sleep was hard to come by. Every snap, every rustle in the underbrush had my nerves on edge. The forest had a way of playing tricks on your mind when you were already scared, and I was scared. It must have been sometime after midnight when Haley screamed. I bolted upright, my heart slamming in my chest. The fire was out, and in the darkness, I could barely make out her shape, thrashing as she stumbled toward us, wide-eyed and frantic. Ethan, he's gone. He's gone, she shouted, her voice cracking. I scrambled to my feet, trying to get my bearings. Garrett grabbed the flashlight again, shining it around. But Ethan wasn't there. His sleeping bag was empty. Ethan! Garrett called out, his voice harsh in the still night. Nothing. Just the suffocating quiet of the forest. We fanned out, shining the light into every corner of the clearing, calling his name. But the longer we looked, the more it sank in. Ethan was gone. Garrett cursed under his breath. We need to go. Now. What about Ethan? Haley cried. Garrett turned to her, his face pale. We can't stay here. We'll come back with help. Reluctantly, we packed up what we could and started down the trail, the flashlight beam bouncing ahead of us leading us deeper into the woods. Every step felt like a battle against the growing sense of dread that gnawed at my insides. We were maybe an hour from camp when we heard it again. That whistle. Faint but unmistakable. Garrett stopped dead in his tracks, his hand gripping the flashlight so tight I thought it might snap. The beam swung to our left, catching a figure in its light. It was standing just inside the tree line, still as stone. It wasn't Ethan. The man was tall, gaunt, with wild eyes that gleamed in the flashlight's beam. His face was streaked with dirt, his clothes torn and stained. He didn't move, didn't speak. Just stood there, staring at us. And then, as if some invisible string had been pulled, he turned and disappeared into the trees. No one said a word. We just ran. We ran until our legs burned, until our lungs screamed for air, until the trail blurred beneath our feet. But we didn't stop. Not until we broke through the edge of the forest and saw the outline of Garrett's truck parked in the clearing. We piled in, slamming the doors, gasping for breath. We drove back in silence, the only sound the hum of the engine and the pounding of my heart in my ears. We didn't talk about Ethan. Or the man. Or the way he'd watched us with those wild eyes. I don't know what happened to Ethan.
I don't know if he's still out there, somewhere in those woods. But I do know this, there's something wrong with that place. And I'm never going back. I was never the type to shy away from a good hike, but this one would change everything for me. Back in 1998, I was fresh out of college and still trying to figure things out. My friends and I were all about pushing boundaries, testing limits, at least, that's what we told ourselves. We'd get together every few months, drive out to some random national park or forest, and camp. This time, we were headed to the Harlan County woods in Kentucky, an isolated, thick forest that stretched for miles, the kind of place that swallowed sound and light alike. My buddy Roman had planned this particular trip. Roman was always the guy who needed to prove himself, to himself, to us, to the world. He'd drag us into the most extreme hikes and laugh it off when we complained. Me? I guess I went along with it because I didn't want to be the one left out. There was something about the group dynamic that kept me in the game. There were six of us this time, Roman, James, Heather, Elena, Kurt, and me. Roman, of course, had mapped out the trail, a barely their path that he claimed had been used by hunters for decades but wasn't on any official maps. Perfect, right? When we first set out, everything felt like it always did, exciting, but predictable. It was early morning, and the air was crisp and damp with the promise of fall. Heather and Elena were taking pictures of the wildflowers that lined the forest floor, and Roman was already ten feet ahead, machete in hand, cutting through the undergrowth like it was his personal mission to tame the wild. Kurt kept joking that Roman would get us all killed one day. You trust him? Kurt had said to me that morning as we loaded up the gear into the car. Not really, but what's life without a little risk? I'd replied, grinning like an idiot. Now I wish I hadn't. By midday, we'd covered a good amount of ground. The trees were towering overhead, blocking out most of the sunlight. It was one of those forests where everything felt too quiet, no birds, no rustling leaves. Just us and the sound of our boots crunching on the ground. Anyone else getting the creeps? Heather asked as we stopped to eat lunch. She was trying to laugh it off, but there was a nervous edge to her voice. I'm always creeped out around you, Heather, James said with his usual smirk, though he didn't sound as confident as he usually did. We all laughed it off, but there was something about the silence that didn't sit right with me. The day wore on, and the sky darkened with the promise of a storm that never quite arrived. Roman had us pushing farther than I thought we needed to go. We didn't pass any landmarks or other hikers. Hell, it didn't even feel like a trail anymore, just endless trees, rocks, and moss-covered ground. Roman had some kind of internal compass that he swore by, but it was getting harder to trust it. By dusk, we reached a small clearing with a half-collapsed cabin. It looked like it hadn't been touched in decades, covered in vines and leaning at an angle that made it seem like it could fall at any moment. Let's set up camp here, Roman said clearly proud of his find. We were all exhausted, and none of us argued. We pitched our tents near the cabin, joking about how it might collapse on us in the middle of the night. But that was the thing about our group, we laughed in the face of danger because it felt better than admitting when we were scared. We gathered around the fire, eating dinner and sharing stories. That's when things started to feel off. James had wandered off to gather more firewood, and when he came back, he looked pale, like he'd seen something he couldn't explain. You okay, man? I asked. Yeah, just... I thought I heard something out there. Like someone talking. Roman laughed, that loud bark of his that always made him sound like he didn't care about anything. It's the woods, man. They play tricks on your mind. You hear echoes, the wind, all that. James didn't look convinced, but he shrugged it off and sat down. 
But the thing was, after that, the atmosphere changed. Maybe it was because we were in such an isolated place, or maybe it was the growing sense that we weren't alone. Later that night, after the fire had burned low and we'd all retreated to our tents, I couldn't sleep. I kept hearing sounds, like twigs snapping, soft footsteps. At first, I figured it was one of the others going to the bathroom or something, but the footsteps circled the camp. They were deliberate, too slow to be an animal and too close for comfort. I unzipped my tent just enough to peer out. The campfire cast long shadows across the clearing, and for a second, I thought I saw something moving between the trees. It was too quick to make out clearly, but I knew what I saw. A figure, tall, human, just watching. Then it was gone. I stayed frozen, listening. That's when I heard it again, the unmistakable sound of someone. Walking around our camp. But this time, it was inside the perimeter, close to the tents. My heart raced, but I didn't want to move. I could hear breathing, not from any of us, but from something else. There was a rustling, and then I heard Kurt's voice, loud and panicked. Who the hell is out there? Everyone shot out of their tents at once, flashlights flicking on and scanning the area. Nothing. No one. Roman was the first to speak, trying to keep control of the situation. It's probably just some local messing with us. Maybe a hunter or something. But even Roman didn't look convinced. We spent the next hour searching the area around the camp, calling out, but no one answered. The woods were still silent. Too silent. We eventually decided to call it a night, though no one really slept. I stayed awake, listening, waiting for something else to happen. And it did. Sometime after midnight, there was a scream, high-pitched and cut short. It came from Elena's tent. We rushed over, but when we unzipped her tent, she was gone. The sleeping bag was empty, her shoes and flashlight still inside. There were no signs of a struggle, just the eerie, unsettling fact that she had vanished. Roman started barking orders, telling us to stay calm, that we'd search for her at first light. But I could see the fear in his eyes. This was beyond him now, beyond any of us. We didn't wait for dawn. We grabbed what gear we could and began searching the woods, calling out her name. But there was nothing, just more of that suffocating silence and the feeling that we were being watched. An hour into the search, Heather tripped over something in the dark. When she aimed her flashlight down, we saw it, blood. A long trail of it, smeared across the ground. I don't know how we managed to keep going after that. We followed the trail until we reached the edge of a small ravine. That's where we found her, Elena. She was at the bottom, lying motionless, her body twisted in a way that no one survives. It didn't make sense. There was no way she could have fallen on her own, not without making more noise, not without us hearing her scream again. Someone did this, James whispered, his voice shaking. Someone pushed her. But who? And why? Roman wanted to go down and check, but I stopped him. There was no point. Elena was gone, and there was nothing we could do. We needed to get out of there, fast. We gathered the group and headed back to camp, grabbing our gear as quickly as possible. No one talked. We all just knew someone had been watching us, stalking us, and Elena wasn't the first. She wouldn't be the last. As we made our way back through the forest, I couldn't shake the feeling that whoever had killed Elena was still out there, watching us. Waiting. We never found out who it was. The police called it an accident, said she must have slipped and fallen. But I know better. We all did. And Roman? He never organized another hike again. The first thing you should know about me is that I've spent my whole life outdoors.
I grew up in a small town near the Smoky Mountains, where every weekend was a camping trip, and every summer was spent exploring deeper and deeper into the forest. You could say I know my way around the woods better than most people know their way around their own neighborhood. That's why when my buddy Dave called me up one weekend in 1998 and said, let's go hike that old trail up near Mount Sterling, I didn't hesitate. Mount Sterling is one of those spots not many people know about. It's tucked away in the remote parts of the Smokies, far from the popular hiking trails. The trailhead itself isn't even marked on most maps, which made it even more appealing to us. No tourists, no crowds, just the wild and whatever adventures we could find out there. The morning was crisp when we set out. Early fall meant the air had a bite to it, but the trees were still thick with green leaves just starting to turn. We packed light, just a couple of flasks, some jerky, and a tarp in case the weather turned. Dave and I had hiked together dozens of times, so we knew how to travel fast and quiet, which is essential in these woods. Sometimes you catch sight of black bears or even wild boar if you're lucky. This trip, however, something else would be watching us. By the time noon rolled around, we were deep in the wilderness, off the beaten path. There was no sign of human life for miles just the steady crunch of our boots on the dirt and the occasional bird call. The trail narrowed, weaving through towering trees that blocked most of the sunlight. The only sound was the wind whispering through the branches, and every now and then, the distant rustle of animals moving through the underbrush. It was peaceful, until it wasn't. About mid-afternoon, Dave spotted something strange. Just off the trail, hidden behind a cluster of trees, was a small clearing with an old, weathered cabin. It looked abandoned, almost forgotten by time. There was no road leading to it, no signs of life, just this decaying structure standing there like a ghost from the past. Think anyone lives here? Dave asked, already stepping off the trail to investigate. Nah, I replied, following him. Too far out for anyone to stay long. Maybe an old hunting cabin or something. As we got closer, I noticed something odd. There were no tracks, no signs of human activity, but the door to the cabin was slightly ajar, hanging crooked on its rusted hinges. The windows were broken, and the whole place gave off an unsettling vibe. The kind of feeling you get when you're being watched, even when there's no one around. We didn't talk about it, but both of us were on edge. Dave's always been more curious than cautious, though, and before I could stop him, he was pushing the door open and stepping inside. Smells like something died in here, he muttered, covering his nose. I followed him inside, and the air was thick with rot, like decaying wood mixed with something worse. The floorboards creaked under our feet and dust filled the air as we moved through the cramped space. It was a one-room cabin, with a small, rusted stove in the corner and a single bed frame without a mattress. But what caught our attention was the wall. Scrawled across it in what looked like charcoal were strange symbols. They didn't look like any language I'd ever seen, just jagged, sharp lines and shapes that seemed to swirl together. Think some local kids did this? I asked, though I didn't really believe it. Maybe, Dave replied, but he sounded uncertain. But this is old. Look at how faded it is. I didn't want to stay in that cabin any longer, so I stepped outside for some fresh air. Dave lingered behind, still examining the symbols, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. The woods felt different, like the air had grown heavier. The wind had stopped, and the forest was unervingly quiet. Let's go, I called out to Dave. He finally emerged, looking as uneasy as I felt. We continued our hike, but the mood had changed. There was no more joking or casual conversation, just a heavy silence between us. It wasn't long before we realized something was wrong. The trail we'd been following had disappeared. One moment we were on it, 
The next we were in the middle of dense forest with no clear direction. We're turned around, I said, trying to keep my voice calm. That's impossible, Dave replied. I was keeping track. But there was no denying it. We were lost, deep in the mountains with no clear way out. I tried to retrace our steps, but every direction we turned seemed to lead us further into the unknown. The trees began to look the same, and soon, I couldn't even tell which way was north. By now, the sun was starting to set, casting long shadows over the forest. We hadn't seen any wildlife for hours, and the silence was becoming oppressive. I could feel the tension between us growing. Every rustle of leaves made me jump, and the strange symbols from the cabin were still stuck in my mind. As dusk settled, we decided to set up camp for the night. We found a small clearing and laid out our tarp, but neither of us could relax. The woods felt wrong, like they were hiding something just out of sight. We barely spoke as we ate our jerky in silence. Then, just as the last bit of light faded, we heard it, a low, rhythmic sound, like drumming. It was faint at first, but it grew louder, coming from deep within the forest. It wasn't the wind, and it wasn't animals. This was deliberate, like someone, or something, was out there. Dave and I exchanged nervous glances. You hear that, right? he whispered. Yeah, I replied, gripping my flask a little tighter. We listened, frozen, as the sound got closer. It was coming from the direction of the cabin, but we couldn't see anything in the dark. Suddenly, the drumming stopped. The silence that followed was worse, thick and heavy, like the entire forest was holding its breath. I don't know how long we sat there, listening, but eventually, I couldn't take it anymore. I stood up, scanning the trees with my flashlight. Then, I saw it. A figure, just at the edge of the clearing, barely visible in the darkness. It was tall, taller than any man I'd ever seen with long limbs that seemed to stretch unnaturally. It didn't move, just stood there, watching us. Dave, I whispered, my voice barely audible. We need to go. He followed my gaze, and when he saw it, his face went pale. What the hell is that? He breathed. We didn't wait to find out. We grabbed our packs and bolted, running blindly through the forest crashing through branches and underbrush. The figure didn't follow us, but I could feel it watching, tracking us as we ran. By some miracle, we found the trail again just as the first light of dawn broke through the trees. We didn't stop until we reached the trailhead, breathless and shaken. Neither of us spoke about what we'd seen, not right away. It wasn't until a few days later, after we'd both had time to think, that Dave called me up. He'd been doing some research, looking into old Smoky Mountain folklore, and he found something, a story about a creature called the Tall Man, a figure that stalks lost hikers in the woods, leading them deeper and deeper into the wilderness until they disappear forever. I don't know if that's what we saw. All I know is that we're lucky we made it out of those woods. Not everyone does. A few weeks after our hike, I read about a missing hiker, someone who'd gone up to Mount Sterling and never came back. They never found his body. Just like the story said. We haven't been back since. It was supposed to be just a regular weekend. Me, Jensen, Shiloh, and Oscar had planned this hiking trip for weeks. We all needed to blow off some steam, life had been throwing its punches lately. I was stuck at a dead-end job at a manufacturing plant, Jensen was fighting his way through the final year of law school, Shiloh had just broken up with her girlfriend, and Oscar, well, he was Oscar. Always unpredictable, always in the middle of some kind of chaos. But this hike was supposed to be our escape, our break from the noise of everyday life. We'd heard about the Appalachian Trail through some friends, who said the stretch near Linville Gorge was remote, 
perfect for disappearing into the wild for a weekend. It was early October, so the air had that crispness to it, cool but not cold. The trees were beginning to turn, bright reds and oranges flickering like fire against the mountain backdrop. It was beautiful out there, no denying that. We set off from the trailhead around mid-morning, loaded down with tents, sleeping bags, and enough snacks to feed an army. The first few hours were easy, nothing but joking around, the sound of boots crunching on dirt, and the occasional gust of wind rustling the leaves overhead. Jensen kept us entertained with stories from his legal internships, things he'd seen in court that were straight out of TV dramas. It felt good to laugh. By the time we hit the halfway mark, we were deep into the woods. No cell service, no signs of civilization. It was just us, the mountains, and the trail stretching ahead. We set up camp near a clearing by a small creek, the sound of running water providing a relaxing soundtrack as we started on dinner. A couple of hot dogs roasted over a fire and a few beers, we were set. Night fell quicker than I expected. One minute, the sky was awash in pink and purple hues, the next, we were enveloped in darkness. That's when things started to feel, off. It wasn't anything specific at first, just a feeling, like someone was watching us. Shiloh mentioned it first. She was always the most in tune with stuff like that. Do you guys feel that? She asked, her voice low, almost like she didn't want the woods to hear her. We all stopped what we were doing, Oscar halfway through cracking open another beer, Jensen poking at the fire with a stick. Feel what? Oscar asked, not bothering to hide the sarcasm in his voice. Shiloh glared at him. Like we're not alone, she said, her eyes scanning the tree line. Like someone's out there. At first, we all brushed it off as nerves. After all, we were miles away from the nearest town, probably thirty miles from the nearest road. There was nothing out here but wildlife and the occasional hiker. But then, the rustling started. It was faint at first, like leaves being shuffled around. Then, a branch cracked, loud enough to make us all stand up. We stared into the darkness beyond the firelight, trying to make out what was out there, but all we could see were shadows, shadows that seemed to move when we weren't looking. Probably just a deer, Jensen said, trying to sound casual, but I could hear the tension in his voice. Deer don't break branches like that, Shiloh whispered. We went quiet again, straining our ears. That's when we heard it, a low, almost guttural sound, like someone, or something, was breathing, just beyond the tree line. My skin crawled, and I suddenly regretted every horror movie I'd ever watched. Oscar, always the brave one, stood up, grabbed a flashlight from his pack, and started towards the trees. Oscar, don't, Shiloh warned, grabbing his arm, but he shook her off. Come on, you guys are acting paranoid. It's probably just an animal. He flicked the beam of the flashlight towards the noise. For a moment, nothing happened. The light cut through the darkness, revealing nothing but trees and bushes. Then, something moved. It was fast, too fast for us to see what it was clearly. But whatever it was, it wasn't an animal. It was too tall, too upright. Oscar froze, the beam of his flashlight shaking. What the, he started, but before he could finish, we heard it again. That low, raspy breathing, closer this time. My heart pounded in my chest, and I could tell by the look on Jensen's face that he felt it too. This wasn't normal. Something was wrong. Oscar, get back here, I said, my voice barely above a whisper. But he didn't move. He just stood there, staring into the trees, the flashlight still shaking in his hand. Then, without warning, the light went out. Shit, Oscar cursed, fumbling with the flashlight. It's dead. No way, Jensen said, 
I checked the batteries this morning. Oscar smacked the flashlight a couple of times, but it was no use. The darkness swallowed us, leaving only the dim glow of the campfire. That's when we heard the footsteps. Slow, deliberate footsteps, coming towards us from the trees. My stomach. Dropped. Shiloh grabbed my arm, her nails digging into my skin. I could feel her shaking. What the hell is that? She whispered, her voice trembling. I don't know, I whispered back, my throat tight with fear. The footsteps stopped just beyond the reach of the firelight, and for a long moment, everything went still. Then, a voice. You're not supposed to be here. It was low, almost a growl, but definitely human. My blood ran cold. I looked at Jensen, who was white as a sheet and Oscar, who had finally backed up towards the fire, his face pale. Who's there? Oscar called out, trying to sound brave, but his voice cracked. No response. Just silence. The kind of silence that makes your skin crawl, that makes every hair on your body stand up. I could feel my heart hammering in my chest, and I knew we had to get out of there. But where would we go? We were miles from the trailhead, with nothing but darkness between us and safety. Then, without warning, a figure stepped into the light. Tall, dressed in dark, tattered clothes, face obscured by a hood. I couldn't make out much more than that in the flickering firelight, but the thing that stood out to me the most was the knife in his hand, long, serrated, and covered in something dark. My stomach churned. We're leaving, Jensen said, his voice shaking. We didn't mean to, before he could finish, the figure lunged. It was fast, faster than I could process. One second, Jensen was standing beside me, the next, he was on the ground, clutching his side, blood seeping between his fingers. Ron! I yelled, grabbing Shiloh and pulling her towards the trees. Oscar was already sprinting ahead of us, crashing through the underbrush like a wild animal. I didn't look back. I didn't want to see if the figure was following us. All I could think about was getting away, putting as much distance between us and that thing as possible. We ran for what felt like hours, our lungs burning, branches whipping against our faces. Eventually, we collapsed by a fallen tree, panting, our bodies trembling with exhaustion and fear. Jensen, Shiloh gasped, tears streaming down her face. I shook my head. There was nothing we could do for him now. If he was even still alive. We have to keep moving, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. We can't stay here. But before we could get to our feet, we heard it again, that low, raspy breathing. Closer this time. Too close. I looked at Oscar, who was frozen in place, his eyes wide with terror. He's here, Oscar whispered, his voice barely audible. The last thing I remember is seeing the glint of that knife in the moonlight, hearing Shiloh scream, and then, darkness. When I woke up, it was morning. The sun was shining, birds were chirping. It was like nothing had happened except for the blood on my hands. We planned that hiking trip for weeks. It wasn't some casual weekend thing, we had every detail set, like a military operation. Gabe was the one who got us into it, always talking about how the remote trails in the Pacific Northwest were untouched by civilization. This place isn't even on the map, he kept saying and that's why we were all in. Four of us, me, Gabe, Tommy, and Victor. It was supposed to be the ultimate escape from our usual routine, just some friends hiking through a remote forest, no cell service, no responsibilities, nothing but nature. I didn't expect we'd end up fighting for our lives. I'd known Gabe since high school. Always the adventurer, always pushing boundaries. Tommy?
He was the laid-back guy, the one who'd rather chill than go on hikes, but he didn't want to miss out on this trip. Victor was new to our group, a buddy of Gabe's from work. He was quiet, kind of intense, and I didn't know much about him. That made things a little weird, but Gabe vouched for him, so we didn't worry. We left early that Friday, the sun just barely creeping over the horizon. The first couple of hours were fine, laughs, some stupid jokes, and a lot of Gabe pointing out different trees and wildlife like he was some kind of tour guide. It wasn't until we reached the real backcountry that the vibe shifted. The forest was thick, the trail narrow, and the deeper we went, the quieter it got. It was like the trees were swallowing the sound. We stopped for a break around midday. I remember Tommy saying something about how it felt like we were being watched. We laughed it off, blaming it on how isolated we were. Dude, you've been playing too many horror games, I said. He shrugged, but the look in his eyes said he wasn't totally kidding. As the day stretched on, the trail became more of a suggestion than an actual path. There were no more markers no signs. Just trees. Tall, oppressive, and endless. By the time the sun started to dip, casting long shadows between the trees, we knew we were deeper into this forest than we'd intended. Gabe had his GPS, but it was glitching, constantly trying to reorient itself. Piece of junk, he muttered, smacking it against his palm. We were getting antsy, so we set up camp in a small clearing. The air had this strange stillness, like everything had gone to sleep except us. Victor was on edge, pacing around the camp, his head snapping up at every little sound. Relax, man, Tommy said, setting up his tent. You're making me nervous. I don't like this place, Victor muttered. Something's not right. None of us really paid him any mind. The dude always seemed wound tight. We chalked it up to first day jitters. But that night, everything changed. Around midnight, I woke up to the sound of snapping branches. I sat up, listening, thinking it was just one of the guys wandering off to take a piss. But then I heard it again. It wasn't footsteps, it was more like something dragging. I glanced over to see if anyone else was awake, but their tents were zipped up, silent. I unzipped mine slowly, the metallic sound unnaturally loud in the stillness. The air was thick, suffocating. I stepped out, my flashlight flickering as I scanned the trees. Nothing. But the sound was still there. It was coming from just beyond the edge of the clearing. I took a few hesitant steps toward it when suddenly, Gabe's ten unzipped, and he popped his head out. You hear that? he whispered. I nodded, my heart pounding in my chest. We stood there for what felt like hours, listening. Then it stopped, just like that. Silence. No wind, no animals. Nothing. The next morning, Victor was gone. At first, we thought maybe he'd gotten up early to scout ahead or something. But his tent was empty, his pack still there. Nothing was missing except him. Gabe and I searched the area while Tommy stayed behind to make sure Victor didn't come back. The forest was dense, every tree looking the same, and after an hour, we still hadn't found any trace of him. By midday, we were getting frantic. Tommy kept saying it was weird that Victor would just disappear without his gear, but Gabe stayed calm. Too calm, honestly. He said we'd probably run into him further up the trail. But there was this flicker in his eyes that made me think he wasn't so sure. Around dusk, we returned to camp, and that's when Tommy made the discovery that flipped everything upside down. I found something, he called out, his voice shaking. We ran over, and there, under a pile of leaves, was a knife. It was bloody, fresh blood. And it wasn't one of ours. It looked old, worn, like it had been used for more than just camping. I don't know why, 
but the sight of it made my stomach turn. Something wasn't right. Gabe tried to play it off. It could be anything, he said. Maybe some hunter dropped it. But Tommy wasn't buying it. A hunter wouldn't just leave something like this lying around. The sun was setting, and we decided to stick close to camp. No more wandering off. But none of us could shake the feeling that we weren't alone. That night, I barely slept, every rustle of the leaves sounding like something, or someone, moving through the trees. Around three in the morning, the dragging sound came back. Louder this time. Closer. I sat up, clutching the knife I kept next to me. Gabe was already awake, staring out into the darkness. Tommy was curled up in his sleeping bag, shaking like a leaf. I don't like this, man, Tommy whispered. We should have never come here. Before I could respond, there was a scream, a blood-curdling, heart-stopping scream. And it wasn't for many of us. We bolted out of the tent, shining our flashlights wildly into the forest. The sound of something, or someone, crashing through the underbrush filled the air. And then we saw him. Victor. Running toward us, his face pale, eyes wide with terror. But something was wrong. His clothes were torn, and he was covered in dirt and blood. He collapsed at the edge of the clearing, gasping for air. He's, he's out there, Victor panted, barely able to speak. He's been watching us. Following us. Who? Gabe demanded, grabbing Victor by the shoulders. I don't know. Victor stammered. Some guy, he's been stalking me since yesterday. He has a gun. We stood there, frozen trying to process what Victor was saying. A gun? Out here? Why? And then it hit me. The knife. The blood. We need to leave, I said. Now. We grabbed what little we could and started moving, but the forest seemed to close in on us. The path we'd come in on was gone, like it had been swallowed by the trees. We were running blind. Then we heard it, the unmistakable sound of a gunshot. We hit the ground, the deafening crack echoing through the forest. I looked over at Gabe, and I'll never forget the look in his eyes, pure fear. This wasn't some random guy lost in the woods. This was someone hunting us. We scrambled to our feet, adrenaline surging, and ran. We didn't know where we were going, just that we had to get away. The trees blurred together as we tore through the underbrush, the sound of footsteps crashing behind us. Another gunshot. And then, silence. We ran until we couldn't run anymore, collapsing in a clearing miles from where we'd started. None of us spoke, too exhausted and terrified to say anything. But we all knew we weren't alone out there. Someone was hunting us. And Victor's bloodied clothes told me that this guy wasn't going to stop until he'd taken what he wanted. As the sun started to rise, casting a sickly orange glow through the trees, we knew we had to keep moving. We weren't safe. We'd never been safe. And we never saw Victor again. We reached the nearest town by noon, collapsing at the first gas station we found. Gabe and Tommy never said a word about what happened after that. Neither did I. The guy with the gun? Still out there. The quiet of the Appalachian Trail that morning was a stark contrast to the chaos that was about to unfold. I'd been hiking for years, long enough to know its rhythms, its subtle warnings and the way the forest sometimes seemed to whisper secrets. But on that particular morning, something was different. The air was still, too still, and the usual sounds of birds and rustling leaves were replaced by an eerie silence. My name is Brian. I was 26 at the time, 
fresh out of college and working in an office job that felt like it was strangling me slowly. Hiking had always been my escape. There's something about the mountains that makes the world feel a little smaller, a little more manageable. I'd heard of the Appalachian Trail through friends and decided to take a solo hike, a short trip, just a few days. I thought it would be a nice way to clear my head. I started my hike from the Georgia end of the trail, heading north. It was late September, the weather cool but not yet cold. Perfect for hiking. I packed light, just enough supplies for the three days I planned to be out there. The trail was mostly empty, midweek hikes tend to be quieter, and that was exactly what I wanted. For the first two days, everything went as expected. I passed a couple of other hikers here and there, exchanged nods, but kept to myself. I camped near a stream the first night and in a clearing the second, enjoying the solitude and the peace that the wilderness offered. The nights were calm, the only sounds the occasional hoot of an owl or the rustle of some nocturnal creature. But on the third day, things started to feel off. I woke up just after dawn, packed up my small campsite, and continued on the trail. I'd planned to cover about ten miles that day and had mapped out a good spot to camp for the night. About three hours into my hike, I noticed something strange. The trail markers, usually bright and clear, seemed to have faded. At first, I thought it was just wear and tear, these trails have been around for decades after all, but the further I walked, the more I realized something was wrong. The trees looked different, the air felt heavy, and the silence was unnerving. I checked my map again, certain I was following the right path, but the more I walked, the less familiar everything seemed. I wasn't lost. Not exactly, but it felt like the trail had shifted beneath me. I shrugged it off, thinking I was just tired, and kept moving forward. By early afternoon, I reached a small clearing that wasn't on my map. It looked like it hadn't been touched by humans in years, overgrown, wild, with trees that seemed older than anything I'd seen before. I paused, debating whether to backtrack or push forward, when I saw it. About twenty yards into the clearing, something was hanging from the trees. At first, I thought it was just debris, maybe some old, abandoned campsite, but as I got closer, I realized it was something much worse. It was bones. Strung up in the branches like some kind of twisted wind chime. They swayed gently in the breeze that I hadn't noticed before, making a soft clinking sound. My stomach turned and every instinct I had told me to turn around and leave immediately. But something kept me there, staring at those bones. They weren't animal bones, they were human. Too large, too familiar. I backed away slowly, trying to make as little noise as possible, but as I turned to leave the clearing, I saw a figure standing at the edge of the trees, barely visible through the shadows. It was tall, hunched over, and moved in a way that didn't seem right. Its limbs were too long, its movements too jerky, like it wasn't used to walking on two legs. My heart pounded in my chest as I took another step back, keeping my eyes on the figure. It didn't move, just watched me, its head tilted slightly to the side as if curious. I don't know how long I stood there, frozen, but eventually, my survival instincts kicked in, and I turned and ran. I've always prided myself on my endurance, I'd trained for marathons, hiked some of the most difficult trails in the country, but nothing could have prepared me for the fear-fueled sprint I made through the forest that day. I didn't care about the trail, didn't care about my supplies. I just ran. I could hear it behind me, its movements clumsy but fast. The sound of branches snapping and leaves crunching underfoot made it clear that whatever was chasing me wasn't far behind. I pushed myself harder, my lungs burning, my legs screaming for relief, but I didn't stop. After what felt like hours, I stumbled into another clearing, this one larger, with a small, dilapidated cabin in the center. It looked abandoned, the windows broken, the door hanging off its hinges, but it was shelter.
I ran for it, slamming the door shut behind me and bracing it with an old chair that was half rotten but sturdy enough to hold, at least for a while. I collapsed onto the floor, gasping for breath, trying to calm my racing heart. For a few moments, there was silence, and I thought maybe I'd lost it. But then I heard the footsteps again, slow and deliberate, circling the cabin. I crawled to one of the broken windows, peeking out just enough to see the figure standing at the edge of the clearing. It was closer now, and I could see it more clearly. It wasn't human, at least not anymore. Its skin was pale and stretched tight over its bones, its eyes sunken and hollow. And its mouth, God, its mouth, was too wide, filled with teeth that were too sharp, too many. I backed away from the window, trying to keep as quiet as possible. The footsteps continued, circling the cabin, getting closer and closer. I searched the room for anything I could use as a weapon, but all I found was an old hunting knife, rusted and dull. It wasn't much, but it was better than nothing. The footsteps stopped. I held my breath, waiting, listening. For a few moments, there was nothing but silence. And then the door rattled. Slowly at first, then harder, like something was trying to push its way in. I gripped the knife tightly, my hands shaking, and positioned myself near the door. The rattling stopped, replaced by a low scraping sound, like nails dragging across wood. It moved to the windows, scratching at the broken glass, searching for a way in. And then, as quickly as it had started, it stopped. I stayed there, crouched by the door, knife in hand, for what felt like hours, waiting for the sound of footsteps, waiting for it to try again. But it never did. When the sun finally started to rise, I gathered what little courage I had left and opened the door. The clearing was empty, no sign of the creature, no sign of the bones I'd seen hanging in the trees. I didn't stop to think. I didn't stop to rest. I ran. I ran until I found the trail again, until I found other hikers, until I was back at the trailhead and surrounded by the safety of civilization. I never went back to the Appalachian Trail after that. Whatever was out there, whatever I saw, it wasn't human. And it was still out there, waiting. No one believed me when I told them what happened. They said it was a bear, that I'd imagined the bones, that the fear had gotten to me. But I know what I saw. And I know that I'm lucky to be alive. I heard about another hiker who went missing a few months later, not far from where I'd been. They never found him. And I didn't need to ask what took him. I already knew. I don't usually get freaked out in the woods. Being from a small town near the Smoky Mountains, hiking's been part of my life for as long as I can remember. I'm the guy who's taken on solo trips more times than I can count. Not because I'm some thrill seeker, but because the woods have always been my escape. But this one trip, though? This one was different. It was late September, and me and my old high school buddies decided to go on a hiking trip before winter crept in. The group wasn't anything special, just me, Dylan, Alex, and Nate. All of us were thirty-something, married or recently divorced, and itching for a bit of a break from the monotony of daily life. Dylan had just gone through a messy split, so we figured a trip out in the wilderness might do him some good. A reset, he called it. We decided to head to a remote part of the forest none of us had been to before, somewhere off the beaten path, way up near Klingman's Dome. Nate's uncle, who works as a ranger up there, told him about this abandoned fire tower deep in the woods, far from the main trails. He said it was a bit of a hidden gem, a great place to camp, and we figured why not. A perfect spot to crack open a few beers and just take in the view. So, off we went. The first few hours were great, 
The weather was crisp, and the leaves were starting to change, that golden hue that makes the Appalachian fall the best time of year to be out here. It felt like old times, laughing, swapping stories from high school, and ragging on each other like we hadn't missed a beat. But around the late afternoon, things got, weird. We were making our way through a particularly dense patch of trees when Dylan stopped. He was looking at something just off the trail, squinting through the branches like he'd spotted something odd. You see that? he asked, voice low. I followed his gaze, but there was nothing there. Just more trees and underbrush. See what? I replied, stepping up next to him. I don't know. Thought I saw someone standing there. Alex snorted. You're losing it, man. That divorce finally scrambled your brains. We all laughed it off, but Dylan didn't. He stood there, staring for a solid minute before finally shaking his head and moving on. Maybe it was nothing. I wanted to believe that. By the time we reached the fire tower, the sun was setting, casting long shadows across the forest floor. The tower itself looked like it hadn't been used in decades, rusted and rickety, but still standing tall over the treetops. Perfect spot to set up camp, or so we thought. We got a fire going, grilled some sausages, and cracked open a few beers. For a while, it was just like any other camping trip. But as the night wore on, that uneasy feeling from earlier crept back. Around midnight, Dylan got up to take a piss. He wandered off into the woods with a flashlight, and we didn't think much of it. But when ten minutes passed, then twenty, we started getting worried. He's probably just taking his sweet time, Alex muttered, clearly annoyed. Maybe he found a nice log to sit on. But something in my gut told me it wasn't that simple. Let's go check on him, I said. We grabbed our flashlights and fanned out, calling his name as we ventured into the dark woods. Nate was leading the way, his light bobbing ahead of me, and after a few minutes, we heard something, footsteps. Heavy, fast, and coming toward us. Nate shone his flashlight in the direction of the sound, and there was Dylan, sprinting through the trees like his life depended on it. Run, he yelled as he barreled past us. I didn't ask questions. When someone runs like that, you just run. We tore through the woods, tripping over roots and crashing through branches, until we burst back into the clearing where the fire tower was. Dylan was already at the base of it, doubled over, gasping for air. What the hell happened? Alex demanded, panic creeping into his voice. Dylan just shook his head, too out of breath to answer. I shone my flashlight toward the tree line, half expecting a bear or something to come charging out after us. But there was nothing. We gotta go, Dylan finally managed to choke out. Now. I'd never seen him that freaked out, not in all the years I'd known him. This was a guy who once climbed a rock face with no ropes, just for the fun of it. He didn't scare easy. What did you see, man? I asked. Dylan looked up, his eyes wide, bloodshot, and filled with something I couldn't quite place. There was someone out there. Watching. Just, standing there. That's it? Nate said, frustrated. Some creep in the woods? Dude, it's probably some hiker messing with you. But Dylan shook his head again. No. It wasn't just some hiker. He, he was holding something. Looked like a knife. A big one. That's when the mood shifted for real. We all felt it, the cold, creeping realization that maybe, just maybe, we weren't alone out here. Pack. Up. Now, I said. I wasn't about to stick around and find out if Dylan was right. We scrambled to gather our gear, stuffing tents and sleeping bags into our packs as fast as we could. The fire was still burning, casting long, 
flickering shadows across the clearing, and every time I looked into the woods, I swore I saw something move. Just out of sight. Then, out of nowhere, we heard it, a low, sharp snap. Like a twig breaking underfoot. We all froze. Who's out there? Mate called, his voice loud but shaky. No answer. Just the sound of the wind rustling through the trees. Mate grabbed the hatchet we'd used to chop firewood and held it up defensively. If you're messing with us, it's not funny. Still, no response. But then, from behind the trees, we saw it, a flicker of light. Like a flashlight beam, darting between the trunks. Someone was out there, and they were watching us. Let's go, I said again, my voice low. We need to move. Now. We started down the path, heading back toward the main trail. The whole time, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being followed. I kept looking back, expecting to see that light again, but it was gone. Just as we were about to reach the edge of the clearing, Dylan stopped dead in his tracks. He was staring at something on the ground, his flashlight beam shaking in his hand. I followed his gaze, and my stomach dropped. There, lying in the dirt, was a body. Face down, limbs splayed out at odd angles, like they'd been tossed there. Oh, my God, Alex whispered. We stood there, frozen, staring at the lifeless form in front of us. It was a man, dressed in a flannel shirt and jeans, his skin pale, almost bluish in the light. But that wasn't the worst part. The worst part was the deep gash running across his back, from shoulder to hip, like someone had sliced him open with a single, brutal stroke. Who the hell is that? Nate whispered, his voice trembling. I don't know, I replied, my heart pounding in my chest. But we need to get out of here. Fast. We backed away from the body, our movements slow and deliberate, trying not to make any noise. But as we turned to leave, we heard something else. Footsteps. Heavy, deliberate, and getting closer. Run, I whispered, and we did. We sprinted through the woods, not stopping until we reached the trailhead. By the time we made it back to the car, we were drenched in sweat, our legs burning, lungs aching. But we didn't stop. We drove all the way back to town in silence, not saying a word until we were sitting in the parking lot of the local diner, staring at each other in disbelief. What the hell just happened? Nate finally asked. None of us had an answer. We reported the body to the authorities and they sent a search team out to investigate. They found the man, right where we said he'd be. But here's the thing, they never found anyone else. No tracks. No signs of a struggle. Nothing. And the man? He'd been missing for three days. A local, apparently, out for a solo hike. They ruled it an accident, said he must have fallen and cut himself on something sharp. But I know what we saw. I know what Dylan saw. There was someone out there with us that night. And they're still out there.